One of the things that I've noticed all over the world, and it started right back with that silverback gorilla in the Riverdale Zoo, and it's become a theme in a lot of what I'm doing, is this idea of animals looking out. And I see it everywhere. I see it in Japan, in Indonesia, in India, in the UK, Canada, and the United States. Animals that are supposedly well treated and have satisfying lives that spend copious amounts of time staring out at the environment that they can never have access to. This particular bear, we have a photographer that's traveled throughout a great part of the world and she's traveling taking photographs of zoos. She's taken thousands so far. And one of these photographs is this one on the screen right now and it shows a bear in a department store zoo. It's on the rooftop of a department store in Bangkok and this zoo has all kinds of monkeys and apes and bears and tigers and you name it. It's called the Pata Zoo, the Pata Department Store. It's a horrendous place. And it shows you this bear looking through this murky window into a world that it can never access. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Japan looking at zoos in the greater Tokyo area. And I took about a hundred photos of this elephant and I thought, I'm no photographer, but I thought this was one of the best photos I'd ever taken. And it obviously just shows a very small part of the elephant's head, the elephant's eye. But I thought the photo showed an elephant that was downtrodden and defeated and had lost hope. And most of the people that I've shown this photo to, they get that impression from the photo as well. And there's very good reason why this elephant is that way. And I fervently believe that it is. And this is something that I see all over. And that's because this elephant has lived for 50 years on this concrete pad by itself. And anyone who knows anything about the natural lifestyle of elephants knows that they live in these matriarchal family groups. The females are always with the same family, always in contact with other members of their family. So probably the worst thing that you could ever do is to put an elephant in this type of impoverished environment and to put an elephant in this type of environment alone. That's probably about as bad as you can get. And this poor elephant just stood around all the time or went into the house and did this bizarre behavior where she would press her head up against the wall. I've never seen any other elephant do this. Press her head, the top of her head, right up against the wall and just push back and forth for long periods of time. And that's when I took that photo of, of the elephant's eye. And what I want to stress is, through these images is I'm not showing you the worst that the zoo world has to offer. Because despite all of the books and all of the materials that are directed at children and other people, all of the PR that's coming out of PR departments at the San Diego Zoo, uh, to the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Toronto Zoo, Calgary, and others, conditions aren't much better than they were in the past. These types of conditions are ubiquitous in the zoo world. They are everywhere. And the people who say they are not everywhere are the ones who haven't seen what's out there. If you look at new exhibits, there's a lot of talk of uh, landscape immersion exhibits, and there's a lot of big pavilion exhibits, some of them costing tens of millions of dollars. Well, this is Elephant Crossing. It's a photo through the glass at the Calgary Zoo. They spent, I believe, between 10 and 12 million dollars constructing this. And it's about as artificial as you can ever get. It bears no resemblance in any way, shape, or form to natural elephant habitat. And to me, if you're going to spend the money, you ought to spend it right and do a good job. And these types of expenditures for these huge glossy exhibits that have more to do with Disney World and Hollywood movie sets than they have to do with real biology or conservation, they're becoming ubiquitous in the zoo world. They're showing up everywhere. And I want to talk more about that a little later. When I talk to kids, I, I talk about uh, four concepts that I want them to understand that all animals need. And obviously, it's, it's far more involved than these four concepts, but I'm trying to simplify it for kids. And I tell, tell kids that animals, number one, regardless of species, need space. You know, in the zoo environment, or even in your pet environment at home, or in, in farm environments, the amount of space that animals are given is usually dictated by the available resources to construct enclosures or cages, or it's dictated by the actual physical space that's available. It's almost never dictated by the actual needs of the animals. So a good rule of thumb when you're looking at animals, and the kids get this, is the bigger the better. It's far better for an animal to have more space than it needs 
than to need more space and not have it. The other concept I, I try to get across to kids is the idea of freedom. And I don't mean that every animal should be let go. I was telling them this morning, well, it doesn't mean you take your pet dog and let him out the street. There you go, lucky, have a good life. That's not what I mean by freedom. What I mean by freedom, especially in the context of captivity, is that every animal should have the ability to make choices. Because that's what we do, that's what animals in the wild do. If a skunk wants to move from this area to this area in its natural habitat, there are thousands of influences on the decision-making process that occurs in that skunk. It occurs in migratory birds, it occurs in elephants, it occurs in fishes, it occurs in all kinds of species. Yet that's restricted or eliminated in captivity. And many animals live these very regimented uh, lifestyles in captivity. So the third concept I talk about is family. And I'm not crazy enough to suggest that every animal, like if you've got a snail in an aquarium or a coral polyp, that it necessarily needs a family. What I mean is that every animal should be existing in its proper social context. So it doesn't make sense to have a lone elephant like Lucy in the Valley Zoo, or even two elephants. It doesn't make sense to have one hippopotamus. It doesn't make sense to have one scarlet macaw. If an animal lives in a particular social context in the wild, it should have that in captivity. And if you can't, I think you have to challenge the idea of it being in captivity at all. And the last thing, and again, I'm stressing, these are very simplistic things because I'm aiming it at a young audience. But the last thing is things to do. Every single animal needs things to do. There's an epidemic of obesity. There's an epidemic of lethargy in zoo animals. That's because they have nothing to do. If you go to keep an animal in captivity, it has to be able to engage in a good portion of its natural movements and behaviors. And if it can't, I think you have to challenge its captivity. So those are the four things that I look at uh, when, or that I talk about when I talk to kids.